Yeah. Well, it all seems to work against evolution, doesn't it, Dr. Corner? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Carter, I got a question for you. Yeah. If you don't mind. Um, so, you know, cards on the table. I am not a theistite. I am a, you know, old earther, if you will. And wow. genetics is not my area of expertise. I studied rocks when I went to college. <laughs> so I, I hate all things living, dead rocks. <laughs> you know. And um, you guys have been talking a bit about the uh, accumulation of mutations and stuff like that, right? And the uh, I think Neff was saying how humans should have died out over millions of years of mutations in the gen genome, right? Right. That's an accurate assertion. Well, it's yeah, Kondrashov that, that said it, not Neuf. Well, still, I mean, it, that, that's not a mischaracterization of your stance, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, my question is, um, could you explain in maybe somewhat brief uh, how you know that the uh, – like how you know at what point the code is too full of mutations for it to be bad? Like, like the code's, you know, gigantic, right? Right, and right. it accrues these singular mutations at like an allele level and stuff, I think. So mm -hmm. why why do you why is the statement that it should be too full already? How do you know that? Should be too what? Like the argument is that it should be too full of mutations if humans have been mutating millions of years. How, oh, at it. what yeah. point do you know that's because people I, I always hear the phrase it should have we should all be dead from mutations by now but never an explanation as to you know how full is that container does that make sense right right so if you imagine like let's say you had a, a hundred um letters of the code and um there's certain areas like let's say position six that if it's anything different from an a um, then that protein no longer functions and the organism dies. And, and there are cases where it's that particular. Yes. But then there's cases where you can change it to a couple different things. And it, and there's silent mutations. Like the, the code can change, but you still end up getting the, the same amino acid put in its place because of the wobble codon. So, and that wouldn't affect anything. The, the protein would be identical, even though the DNA had a little tiny change in, in one of the, the chemical bases and one of the letters there. Yes. Um, and then you can have a mutation where you, you, instead of getting one um, nonpolar amino acid, you end up with another nonpolar amino acid. So it's like saying, all right, you switched olive oil with avocado oil. Yeah, they're a little different, but they both don't like water. They both repel water and that gives the protein a certain property. So that may not be uh, lethal if you swap out one hydrophobic amino acid for another hydrophobic amino acid. So it, it's hard to say, you can't just say, all right, if it's 10% uh, of the code has changed, then it's lethal because sometimes it can be just one base and sometimes you can change, you know, maybe quite a few, uh, maybe two, three or four amino acids and still have it be functional. I mean, just in, in the human population, we have quite a number of mutations in our hemoglobin Yes. genes yet we can still breathe you know maybe some people struggle if they you know they're not going to be tour de france athletes or they're not going to climb mount everest <laughs> yeah they, they don't get a gas exchange at high elevation but it's not lethal so there's a lot of factors at play one is it is it lethal where you don't even make it out of the womb or is it lethal but you still live long enough to reproduce and pass on the gene yeah, but you just die in, at 40 instead of at, you know, six months old. Whatever, yeah. Right. So it's, it's hard to really put a number. Um, but uh, I guess an analogy would be like, you know, and then having a book and you can change a few words and, you know, some of the words become nonsensical. Like you, you, yeah, you, change you can change the words in a sentence. And you're like, oh, wait, that doesn't yeah. make sense. But you can still kind of get the no. gist of what the story is about. Yeah. But eventually, uh, as you accrue more of these uh, mutations, the book becomes illegible. There, there's no, it doesn't make sense. You're just making random proteins that are just folding in all sorts of weird shapes that don't have a purpose. You okay. Know, just, you're making complete garbage and you're wasting right. energy doing it. 
and or you might accidentally make something that's detrimental like an enzyme without a, a regulator site so it just starts chopping everything to pieces non-stop and mm. and it can't be shut down i mean this this is a very uh, real problem with uh, cells and, and especially in the primordial soup um i'll give you an example with um with a ribosome there's so many different complex parts you have the the rna the ribosomal rna the protein uh subunits themselves you need the trna uh you need the amino acid uh, trna synthetases and you need the amino acids and uh, and I'm, that's just a, a few of the things you need to make that work um it's sure. irreducible co complex you you can't have only part of those to, to and still have the system working well rice and toxin you know the toxin from castor bean plants that's twelve thousand times more toxic than rattlesnake venom one molecule one little wow. tiny molecule of that um it will bind to you know, pretty much any cell in our body that has galactose on it and will deliver it'll cause the toxin to be taken up by endocytosis um and then the a chain of that toxin will come off of there and it is an enzyme that cuts off just the base of adenine, the adenine base off of ribosomal RNA. So all of, all of that stuff there, it's just one single base on the ribosomal RNA that's that's um, depurinated. Um, and, um, and that causes the whole ribosome to shut down. Like it'll shut down 4,000 wow. ribosomes a minute with just yeah. one molecule inside of a cell. So you, wow. you can imagine how like just getting one of those letters wrong in all of those complex things, not only the code to make the proteins, but the, the code that's in the mRNA and the rRNA and the tRNAs themselves, if just one of those is wrong, you could shut down protein synthesis. Wow. So that's, things can be very finicky, but deadly. there's also areas that are have a little more robustness that you can tinker around with. So it's at some point, you know, the reason why we're here is we're the ones who got the mutations in the spots that weren't so bad. <laughs> yeah. Or you got, you substituted one hydrophobic amino acid for another one, but you know, mm -hmm. Hey, if, if you give birth and, and you got a mutation in the active site of an enzyme, uh, you're probably not gonna, you know, that, 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 that uh, your offspring oh, could die after a couple of days or, or, or a couple of months of development, you know, it depends. So on how bad the mutation um, is. Yeah, so don't mess with protein codes. Um, if I was to shorthand say <laughs> the argument in just a few minutes for my, own, for my own <laughs> cast, um, you know, the argument is that um, the odds aren't in our favor that the mutations would have not killed us by now. Is that basically kind of it? Because there's certain mutations that can be so small that can be so massively detrimental. Is yeah, that... but eventually you're going to run out of possibilities, right? Uh, sure, eventually. Sure. Um, the, the areas that are more sensitive, um, to, to causing death are, are going to, uh, be, be mutated, but obviously they will be selected out. Yeah. So the ones that are surviving are the ones that get the areas that are what we call like near neutral mutations. It's not ideal. It might, it might mess with the 40 genome plan, you know, it might make the protein come out a little too fast. So half of those proteins end up not folding right, um, but it's enough to live on but you're still causing degradation to the integrity of the code. And so um, evolution isn't very good at getting rid of those near neutral mutations. They'll just keep accumulating and accumulating until we Does run out of possible <clears throat> a mechanism to what? Get rid of it? Does that, well, is there a mechanism, mechanism to down. adjust so that the either change the code back or to adjust to the new code? Well, it doesn't know to change it because it's not giving a survival advantage and, well, and it's yeah, not I'm enough of a survival the disadvantage. Ones you were talking about. Yeah, the, the, the near neutral ones, they don't give a survival advantage because they haven't changed anything yes. positively in, a, in an environment. Um, but they also are not um, removed by natural selection, which you need death for. You, you need the organism to die before reproducing to get rid of that. Yeah, near neutral mutation, but they're going on living and reproducing, and so they're going to keep passing that down their whole family tree, and then okay. they'll they'll just keep building up. So yeah, it just you run out of places where mutations are are possible, and and it's the little things that can add up. You know, you might be able to live long enough to reproduce, but maybe you you're more prone to cancer. You're more prone to um, eventually having enough problems that you don't live long enough to reproduce, or you, or you're 
offspring are even if you live long enough, you're not able to you're you're no longer um, fertile. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for expanding the uh, topic for me. That was, uh, you know, <laughs> it's nice to have someone who can expand it that way. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Last yeah, I mean, the I day. To give you actual oh. um, experimental data, um, I, I'm thinking of the uh, the the Linsky lab, the long term evolutionary uh, evolution experiment, where they've been growing like seventy thousand generations of E. coli, and yeah. they were all excited when one of the mutants, um, I think it was a, a citrate pump um got moved next to a different promoter that that is active even in the presence of oxygen and normally it's not so it allowed it gave it a slight um advantage to use up the citrate that they naturally put in the broth as a as a ph buffer so it was an extra fuel source for them and so that was a a temporary selective advantage that they had as long as the citrate was there um but um following those um, those mutant strains, they're, they're acquiring enough of these near neutral mutations that they're no longer being viable. Like it used to be that there was like a 30% death rate. And then a couple thousand generations, it was 40. I think some of the cultures are having like a 50% death rate now, uh, wow. of these mutant, mu- the citrate mutant colonies, because they just acquired too many, um, near neutral mutations they are obviously not lethal because they're still growing, but, um, Oh, they're dying off too quickly. They're, you know, they're, yeah, the, the odds aren't in their favor anymore. Yeah. Right. Right. So they're just degenerating and, and all those generations. I mean, you know, that would somewhat equate to millions of years of human evolution because of our 25 year generation time compared to their 20 minute <laughs> generation time. Um, they, they weren't able to see, you know, really novel um, new systems that you would need for massive speciation. It was just, uh, you know, so far all the experiments have shown that evolution just works by uh, tinkering or destroying what already exists, not really improving upon it. And and it's only the environment that keeps it um, the mutations around. Gotcha. Thanks. Sure. Doc, Dr. Carter, I'd like to add, and I think Neff and the rest of the people in the chat will agree. Uh, you have given us an injection of encouragement, knowing that, um, People like yourself actually listen to us, so uh, that's fantastic. That, that, that yeah, was right. fantastic to hear. Uh, I, I, no, yeah, I wish right. I wish more people like yourself actually do join these chats, and so we can share the knowledge. Absolutely, I know. I want to thank you guys. You're, you're doing a terrific job. You're putting out so much more information than that I would even have time to do. And I, like I said, I'm learning a lot of new things by listening to you. And there are more people like me. There's a lot of, of scientists, a lot of PhD level scientists. That, Thank you. Um, that um, totally agree with what you're saying, but they can't say it because they don't want to lose their jobs. Um, right. You're just uh, absolutely yeah. ostracized if, you, uh, I, if you're out of the closet. So to say. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm an, an advocate for that. I've, been, I've only recently been kind of joining these little YouTube channels the last two, three weeks or so, maybe a month or so. And I've, I come from a more hard science engineering background and whatnot and been trying to share with these guys. There are no atheists in science. The only atheists that we can really talk from are, are, are people that I, I describe as being stuck in academic, you know, what I call their, their church schools. Right, right. You get in actual real worlds of science where we're actually developing things. No, there's just... I, I go into details about it, but there's just, there's no atheists in science. I, I, I would actually be really curious to do an unbiased poll to find out. I'm writing an essay mm. about, you know, what, what are the causes and consequences of atheism? Like, you know, if there's this much evidence, what is it that's still keeping them so stuck to their worldview? <laughs> and uh, I think a lot of it is, is psychological. You know, they have, first of all, they oh, have yeah. very distorted ideas of, of what God is like, you know, they, it's the God that Do- Richard Dawkins portrays that it seems scary. And some of them will flat out say, I don't want there to be a God. <laughs> um, yes. I, yes. I, I prefer to have my freedom to do whatever I want to be, to live hedonistic lifestyle. I don't want there to be a moral scorekeeper exactly. to, to have that responsibility. And so they, they have to, they have no other choice because it's either, a, a, you know, a naturalism, a, um, a materialism, a scientism, or there's some sort of intelligent, uh, being that created us and um, and uh, like, or they can say, I'm going to hold out for some other theory that hasn't been invented Joel, yet. Joel, could I ask you, uh, <laughs> sorry to interrupt Ooh. Dr. Cotter, but you could probably bounce in on this too. Uh, Joel, when you say uh, atheist and theist essentially is your conversation, how are you defining theist? And I ask that sure. because 
when when I was working in the uh, in my university, I knew people who you know went to church and stuff in the geology department, but they didn't think, but they didn't believe in Noah's flood and stuff like that. So they would probably can define themselves as Christian, but they weren't going to say as hardline as some of the people in this room, for example. So would that sure. be a atheist to you? Because no. I mean, they they believed in God, but they didn't believe in Noah's flood. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm sorry. I wanted to I wanted to add something real quick before I answer that, if you don't mind, to to Doctor Kerr. Comment. H. G. Wells put what you just said mo the most brilliantly, I think, in ever said. He said, "If there is no God, nothing matters. If there is a God, nothing mm -hmm. else matters." But, yeah. Um, but no, other atheists and theists are basically the opposing uh, religious positions on the same exact religious question on whether or not God exists. So the you would consider a theist to be someone who believes there is a God, but doesn't believe, let's say, in young earth creationism. That'd be a theist to you. Um, yeah, you have to repeat that. I, I, I can only hope to think to simplify it as logically as possible is that theism is the positive logical position on the question of God. Atheism is the negative position of the question of God. All so the other then details. yes, that would be a theist. Somewhat. Yeah, yeah you I can mean, set it up in a dichotomy uh, like that, theism, but I guess theism. the diagram would be easier because then you could, you know, if there are theists that are, uh, that believe in evolution. There are theists that believe yeah. in well, yeah, that's what, that, yeah, that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, engine on the belief in God question. As a matter of fact, I'll, I go into the historical details, and I don't know if Jesse's done the same thing yet, and their own historical uh, professional stuff about how, uh, quote unquote, evolution, the theory of evolution that is that is strictly started by creationists, almost exclusively. Even Darwin himself was a Christian creationist for the majority of his career until he became basically an atheist white supremacist and added Huxley's atheist. Oh, I had to throw that in, didn't you? Yeah. What evolution <laughs> made sense. So, yeah. So even yeah, evolution well. theory quote unquote, is, is creationism just, just with, with, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. That doesn't, so that doesn't change the God question. Um, going back to Darwin and the kind of the psych armchair psychoanalysis of what, what um, <laughs> makes it hard for atheists to, you know, switch to the other side, I guess, you know, I have family members that are atheists, I have friends that are atheists. Um, so we have interesting conversations, but um, <laughs> from what I understand with Darwin, you know, there was a couple of things going through his mind at the same time with his daughter dying of, what was it, scarlet yeah. fever? Or, um, right, daughter Annie. Yeah. yeah that's when he, and, he lost yeah. his Christianity, right? Yeah. And, and then seeing, um, you know, cats torture mice and the mm -hmm. um the wasp that would parasitize spiders and lay their eggs in there mm -hmm. and have them eat them from the inside out. I was like what kind of god would do that and and i think um that is a very important question because we have to answer some of these questions to um open up the possibilities you know we can talk about all the science for uh scientific evidence for a young earth and um and a global flood but there the um there, there's certain um mental blocks a lot of people have this uh, subconscious idea that god is like some overbearing person that they were familiar with in their life like a dad that was just really mean or legalistic or a pastor or that was abusive or um and and the parasite question is super important i've been really interested in yeah. this because um i i see and this is also a good area for testable predictions for creationists because uh, i think parasites were um, are just degenerated to the point that they could no longer metabolize certain food sources, and so they had to rely on a host, on a heterotroph. Yeah. Um, and so we could probably find uh, broken genes in parasites where they used to be able to, you know, like a, a female mosquito might have been able to reproduce without needing a blood meal, mm -hmm. and it would suck plant juices just like the, the male mosquito does. And, um, you know, even even toxins like cholera toxins. I think they uh, found that, Doctor Carter, didn't they? Uh, studying mosquitoes, I think, seem to have read something not too long ago that said that very thing. I think it was on Creation Ministries International. It may have been Creation.com, where they said that uh, it, it it appears genetics has pointed to mosquitoes as uh, having the capacity to survive, or or once were able to survive on fruit juice because of the genetic information that's been found in their genome. So I think that one's already been discovered, if I'm not mistaken. 
Cool. I have to check that out there. There you go. My testable prediction was <laughs> already fulfilled on that one. But, um, but yeah, I, I imagine the same thing. Um, my wife is, a, she has a PhD in microbiology. So she teaches parasitology and, and, and I'm always interested in these um, various parasites and how they got to be that way. And I think that obviously a loving, creative God, all powerful God would not create um, horrible, vicious <laughs> parasites these are just degeneration from accumulated mutations and they didn't die off because they were able to get those resources elsewhere just like we we can uh, live without our vitamin c producing genes that was mutated because we uh, um, eat plenty of fruit and vegetables with vitamin c but maybe we would have lived longer if we made more of that uh, antioxidant <laughs> uh dr connor it will oh, hold on one second. So, um, so I'll say two things really fast. So um, they actually showed during World War II, not that they were intending to do this, you know, um, because mm -hmm. people are confused about car carnivores, oh. um, but lions, tigers, and bears, and, you know, other like, uh, maybe not so much bears, you know, but the other yeah, carnivores actually, huh? so said, oh my, <laughs> oh, oh my. Um, they actually lived off a of cabbage. Um, actually, no, I'm sorry. It was during World War One during the British blockade. And um, number two, I'll just mention this with like regards to like Darwin and stuff like that. Um, most people that I have noticed, this is just out of my experience, the things that I've read in history, they become atheists and non-theists because they either hate God or reject God for something that happened. Right. Lee Strobel is a great example. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. He's got an amazing book called The Case for Faith. And he literally did mm. a case, like a murder case, kind of. He's trying to prove that Jesus didn't die on the cross. You should right. watch his movie, uh, Shadow Dancer. There's I a movie you can watch. Oh, uh, it's called it. the uh, I think it's called The Case for Christ. I've seen yeah. it. Yeah, uh, and it's it. an actual movie about him and how we went through that process of doubting, questioning, and finally being convinced by the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah, he was, a, he was a professional books, legal really journalist. Yeah. He was interviewing all kinds of doctors and, and his other professionals. Psychologists. Yeah, all of it. yeah, he did a book called The Case for Faith, The Case for Christ. I forget what the for third one is. Huh? The Case for God. I think he did one in The Case for God. I, oh, yeah. maybe that was the name I've seen that movie. It was, it was very interesting. It was worth yeah, watching. Yeah, it was very good, you know. And so in regards to, you know, with, you know, how how we're viewing evolution, you know, like, theists that believe in evolution we just consider them misinformed you know it's not that they're not theists they're just being mm -hmm. misinformed because they're being indoctrinated into this information and they're not being shown any other way like right, i'm right. you know i'm fine with people getting taught with whatever but show them all the different categories out there. that's the that's the thing and and it's that's like um, who was that scientist uh, <laughs> that, that said this a uh, philosopher i think it was uh no it was richard well, I can't remember. But anyway, he said, um, we, we accept, uh, I'm paraphrasing, we accept the various ideas of evolution, despite how ridiculous they may seem, because mm -hmm. we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. I've that's heard what that. he said. Yeah, quote, yeah. And, um, and uh, that's a very telling, very telling thing. And so it is a militant wall that they've thrown up against uh, any information coming in because they do know that uh, once the information is easily and, and readily disseminated to university students, high school students, um, it, it's going to cause a flood of dissent from uh, e evolutionism. And that will cause the House of Cards to call it. Oh well, God. yeah, as, as the house atheist, I'm going to obviously point out that I'm not going to be in agreeing to these points. Um, you, you have your opinion on stuff, but I wouldn't say I would describe my view and my journey in your words. So, that's, that's well, I, I, if I had a question for Dr. Carter when we get a chance. Oh, I, and I want to yeah. do an observation on that, too, that, that on the professional scientific side of things, we actually, and I, I, I kind of talk about how it takes generally, it seems these days, about two months to about a year to literally kind of deprogram new college grads these days. Because, you know, in college, like, like Dr. Kerr was talking about, you have to believe the certain paradigm, certain dogma to be able to, to pass a class or to, to, to stay, to keep tenured or whatever. Um, but once you're able to get it, once you're able to prove to be able to, to get into an actual you know, non-academic scientific type position, you find out that that not only were all the the fields of of whatever particular science that, that, that you wanted to be actual professionally in, and much less all the other fields were all based on creationism, but we actually have to show how the the, the atheistic world viewpoint were actually all creationist, basically, and to be able to get people to be able to allow them to be able to create a or be more creative in their own thinking to actually be professional scientists 
effective scientists. But um, there's an Einstein quote about what you were also talking about earlier, Dr. Corey, I wanted to share. I love Einstein. There's a lot of misconceptions about him as far as regarding um, uh, the, the idea that people, most people are atheists because of something that happened in life. He described that perfectly in his, uh, or not perfectly, but similarly in his letter to, to Guy Rayner Jr. in 1949, he said, quote, I am not an atheist. I don't share the crusading spirit of the professional atheist whose fervor is mostly due to a painful act of liberation from the fetters of religious indoctrination received in youth. I prefer an attitude of humility corresponding to the weakness of our intellectual understanding of nature and of our own being, in quote. Hmm, so, lots of observations. Then again, there's just once you get out of academia, you, you, you lose your, your faith in atheism. So, Ogre, before you ask your question, I just want to make a comment, Dr. Carter. When you do your paper, when you do the research on like a poll or whatever, um, add this factor in. So, the majority of the scientific community, from what I've seen on like personal testimonies and stuff like that, um, of creation scientists, they say that their colleagues are actually very, um, what's the word, sympathetic towards our viewpoint, but they just can't say anything because <laughs> of the paradigm, right? Well, I'll tell you where I personally think this paradigm comes from is history. We are being taught in schools. Moses didn't write the Old Testament, and this has been going on for a century, and I didn't even actually learn this until um, two years ago. Um, and there's a lot of historical stuff that's, that's challenging these people's paradigms and their thought processes, right? Because one of the hurdles they have to get over is history. And because history is not taught properly, you know, you're just taught to only basically just memorize dates and times and not to actually to think about it logically, you know, or to lay it on a timeline, they get very confused. So when they hear something like Gobekli Tepe that's dated to 12,000 BC, they're like, oh, well, they must know what they're talking about, even scientists, you know, because they think, well, they're archaeologists, you know, they're in this field. And it's like, no, go in and actually look at it. You know, we're actually finding out that it's much, much newer than that. But that's right. just, just something to throw in for your paper. Yeah, challenge the, the paradigms. So, I, I mean, I think it'd be fun to have a uh, theories of education conversation here, too. I'm an educator as well, so that'd be kind of fun. But my question that I wanted to pose to Dr. Carter, and uh, it's sort of a devil's advocate approach, um, because this mm -hmm. your, con your idea about the parasites is something that's kind of novel to me. I've been listening to creationists for, God, I remember listening to Kent Hovind when I was like eight on VHS tapes. <laughs> but um, I have this parasite conversation would well, be was, was interesting. I'm switching, I'm chopping up so much I can't hear. I'm thinking maybe my headphones are dying. Just give me a second. Oh, sorry. Creationists have been talking about that for quite a while. I just thought I'd point that out. Or... Dr. Uh, Carter, it's it's novel connect. to me. If you can still okay. hear me, because your your uh, output is also choppy, so I think it's your your connection, sir. It's me, Dr. Carter. Oh, he's wondering if it was headphones, but since his his microphone's also choppy. His microphone's also choppy. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's that's better. So my question was on that parasite conversation you were having. That was interesting. Um, to play devil's advocate a bit, you were saying mm -hmm. that to that the parasites are example of changes undergone from the original creation because essentially God wouldn't make a parasite. And is that incorrect in that statement? Is that fair? Well, also, I think there would be some scientific evidence for that, too, that if you can find lost genes that used to have a function um, in those parasites, that would be other evidence that they have degenerated um, over time. And not to the point of lethality, but the point they became totally dependent on a host to survive. Yeah. Um, and again, if I'm, I'm misconstruing your point, I take this back, but a devil's advocate question to that would be wouldn't God have known at the end of all this, they'd be parasites and wouldn't he have built them knowing they would break down, as you say, to become parasites later, thereby making parasites in the first place. Well, I think in its original plan, there wouldn't be nearly as much de degradation, but obviously being omnipotent, he would have yeah, the foreseen that problem. the earth is going to fall apart and that there was going to be de degeneration and, corruption and sin and um, violence on the earth and that's part of the grand scheme of, of the, the great controversy that he's coming to restore things how they ought to be to an Edenic state where you know versus in Isaiah talking about how the lion and lamb will lay down next to each other and the child will reach in the adder, adder's den and not be bit by the snake and that that wasn't uh, 
Um, that's not what his uh, original intention, although he had the foresight to know that that was inevitable. But I, I, I imagine we don't want to get too comfortable on Earth or we wouldn't really look forward to a future with him in, in the restored uh, Eden in the heaven. So good, good point. I can see I can see where you're saying. Why wouldn't an omnipotent God foresee that and have, you know, spare tire genes that can be activated if the first one goes bad? <laughs> Um, and that might even be the case. You know, we might even have some of these backup genes that keep us from completely dying off before um, the second coming. I'd like but, to talk about another idea as well, another perspective. Just even from a coder's perspective, you don't necessarily have to be omniscient to know that if your user base is going to violate the, your original equipment manufacturer's recommendations, that the code is going to break down, things will start working, and things you didn't intend it to do, essentially. A good classic example would be... Um, uh, IBM, not IBM, Microsoft's uh, one of their first online um, uh, chatbots called Tay. They released it to the public a few years ago, and it's supposed to be a, like a teenager type, you know, chatbot AI. And within the first 24 hours, we're just talking to people randomly on the internet, it was it already become like some sort of Hitler loving, you know, anti Jew freaking thing. They had to they had to turn it down. They had to, oh, wow. Yeah, it was it was pretty bad, but um. Yeah, so all, all these parasites, all these negative things in life now are obviously, um, again, OEM violations. And the Bible talks about that. He said sin and disease didn't exist until, or death and disease didn't enter the world. Right. Until sin. Yes. Sin and, and, and death entered the world because of sin, according to Scripture. Right. So I, uh, or is it okay if I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, if you knew that you were going to have kids, would you want to be a part of their lives? Ooh, there you go. If I knew I was going to have kids, would I want to be part of their lives? Yes. I, um, in my current state, I'd probably say yes. Sure. Okay. Well, you know, so it wasn't a trick question. I'm not trying to trick you. So God already knew he was going to create us. He already knew that we were going to fall. He already mm. knew we were going to have the, you know, um, that he was going to have to curse the world because of us, because we fell. But he still wanted to be a part of our lives. Still and a pastor's wanted. wife actually proposed that to me. So, you know, whatever he created in the beginning, because he definitely lost a lot of stuff, a lot of, you know, animals and stuff like that, that, you know, didn't survive um, because of our new atmosphere, all this kind of stuff, you know, parasites, um, mosquitoes, you know, they are all built to be very good. We were built to be very good, but we fell, we cursed the earth. Yeah. I mean, again, as you know, my side of the table, that, that, argument doesn't flow with me i've heard it before that sounds like a uh, i've drank the kool-aid and i'm justifying my choice i can understand why you might feel like that because that requires a supernatural act oh and yeah have, right of course and, and and it's not purely natural you're an you're an evolutionist and a naturalist so you believe that uh uh did dr carter leave yeah Which i like, think he might have dropped out oh uh, okay. yeah, his earlier no, I don't oh. think it's headset because this again his mic and output was also oh, okay. Well, so I mean, um, want to say bye. So, nice. yeah, it requires a supernatural act, and so you're going to dismiss it on based on that. But then, then my response to that is, but we we have so much evidence of the supernatural even in the biological system that exists. So I, I would say that disbelieving the super the the uh, parasitism is a caused by. Uh, um, um, I mean that uh, the curse, rather, um, is is a supernatural act. It really, that's not a consistent place to be. I don't think. But I I know that's your stance. Um, I'm I'm yeah. I, I accept that that is your position. I don't think there's anything wrong. Hey, hello. I don't think there's anything wrong with you having your position and your beliefs. But that's not. I, you said it wasn't supposed to be a trick question. So I'm not going to put you in the spot. Yeah, I'm, I'm not either, but I'll, let me throw this at you. Uh, DNA is information, algorithms, and linguistics, which can only be produced by intelligence. Why don't you believe in intelligent design? So um, my stance on these sort of questions has always been I try to stay in my lane a bit more when it gets advanced. Um, I don't know much about genetics, so I... I I don't know if what you're saying is necessarily. I, my my uh, observation is that you're resisting the truth. That's that's my observation. I, I believe that's your observation. Yes. Yeah. Hey, but you, you know, I, I, I'm I'm willing to go deeper into again my my area of expertise. Uh, 
you know, geology, physics, stuff like that. I'm more interested in going deep into that. If you ask me a question about genetics, I can only go so far because at some point I'm just going to have to take your word on it. And that's where I'm going to falter. Well, you really have to take my word on some things. I mean, if you look at the the, 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 the strata of the earth in the mountains, and remember I showed you these illustrations in our discussion, you can clearly see that they're folded. The scientific evidence says that they can't fold unless they're 10 to 20. I, uh, minimum, I, don't, I don't 10 want to want to get to down in there. I just wanted to ask where you're from. Is it Ogre or Org? Or I love your accent, man. I don't know if it's Boston or. I, I, I'm from Chicago. America. I don't. I, oh, I, I have a speech impediment, technically. So. No, no, you sound like you're from like Chicago or something. I, was, you know, I, I get people. that a lot. It's technically a speech impediment, though. No, no, I, you don't, actually, I don't, I don't sense a speech impediment at all. Your speech is perfectly fine. It's just your accent is, is pretty cool. So. Oh, thanks. <laughs> actually, I thought you were from Boston too. So I'm very <laughs> Joel because I thought I heard a little like I pack my car and okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I heard that too. So oh, I actually God. have to go eat. So, but I wanted to tell you something, Dr. Carter. Um, sure. So with all the genetics and everything you guys have been talking about, you know, it lines up with about, you know, 6,000 years. Is that what you agree with Dr. Carter? Yes. Okay. Um, so recently, well, actually it's not been recently. It's been happening over the past like 50 to 60 years, but of course they don't showcase this. Um, there's about a good chunk of Egyptologists that are coming out and saying that we need to get back to the biblical timeline because we have these massive gaps in history that have nothing. They have historical fluff, basically. And they're actually going with the what's called the contemporary date of uh, the Exodus, 1450 BC. And they're saying that all of Egypt's history need to be shifted forward five to 700 years. Now, these guys aren't even Christians. They're agnostic. Yep. And so I took one date that everybody agrees on. And as the date of Solomon's reign, and this is agnostic, you know, atheist, evolutionist, whatever, there is no disputing Solomon's date. It's 970 BC. And I took it backwards. And um, it literally, it lines up with all of the young stuff of 6,000 years, basically 5,976. That's the age of the earth. Fascinating. I understand the, some of the problems with the Egyptian dating, uh, dating of the um, different uh, periods was that they didn't take into account that sometimes you can have two pharaohs reigning at the same time in different parts of the kingdom and they yeah. put them, they stacked them, you know, sequentially rather well, than overlapping. I'll, so I'll tell you this, if you know more about the, the sequence of the chronology, like the archaic period, old kingdom, first intermediate, first intermediate, gone. Third intermediate is like 330 years, gone. It shouldn't huh. even be there. So that's like 450 years right there. There's the second, uh, Hold on one second. The second intermediate period is still subject to debate you know but i've actually been going over each pharaoh individually and i mean so when people try to say like the pyramids of giza were built in 2600 bc nope tutmos is the third in 1450 bc nope he was actually shishek of the bible in 925 bc that's and amazing it's, it's that's very interesting but I want to let you know that I will be back later. I got to eat and I'm going to let Chris in. So I'm going to go. Thank you so much, Dr. Carter. You're um, if you're still on later, I'll be back. All right. See you, Jess. Yeah. See nice talking to you, Doodles. Too, Ogre. Uh, Ogre. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually uh, dyslexic, so it looks like Ogre to me. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. Okay. I'll see you soon. See you later. Oh, I want to apologize to anyone in chat. I'm not reading any of the messages. I'm, I'm trying to concentrate on what's going on. Um, so if there's <laughs> anything that's uh, interesting, you guys can um, read any questions there might be or any points of dispute. I, I did want to ask, uh, uh, is it org? We've got to get sure. this right. Um, just kind of, a, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want this to be like an ar argument of wishful thinking or anything, but I, I am curious, like, would you want there? To, uh, would you want a god to exist, and what would you want him to be like? Um, so I'm not a. I wouldn't consider myself necessarily a hard atheist. I have no like preconceived issue with a uh, god existing. Uh, I was more anti-theist back in the day, but I've kind of grown out of it because it got boring. <laughs> um, so. Repeat that again, please. I got lost in my own trail. So, so I, it was two questions. Uh, um, would you want a god to exist? Like, as a, a rock person, would you want to be able to, you know, travel to other planets and explore their geologies forever, and you know, not have to worry about 
death and suffering and you know and, and then if you wanted a god to exist what would that god be like like what would his character be like would he be this you know scary judge or would he be just, so the, the, what i what i want a god to exist um to me that's a null question i don't think a god existing uh a i guess let me rephrase that i don't think a uh not interacting god existing would make a difference to me like you know a you know zeus will hit me with lightning bullet if i piss him off i don't want that god to exist <laughs> right, right but the classic modern christian god who's kind of ethereal and you know will respond to your prayer if he wants um, <laughs> Capricious. Um, that, that doesn't mean much to me so if he did right. or didn't exist say la vie uh if uh, if god did exist i imagine i would again probably want him to be benign and be capricious in that way because right i mean i've played video games where god's actually interacted and <laughs> you don't pray to the right shrine and you get debuffs on your character so <laughs> i guess that's probably how i would answer it but then again if you're talking god you're talking by definition outside of my reasoning and bounds and I'm having to reference video games and books to come up with ideas about it. So, do you think that um, may, there would there could be um, logical, rational reasons for God to not just show up in a burning bush or you know a pillar of fire or, or you know? Um, I just love the opinion. on the shoulder and say, "Hey, I'm God. Let me um, you know do some miracles for you." Like, do, could you think of any re uh, reasons why that might not be a good idea? Yeah, because uh, a reason I could think why that wouldn't be a good, why a God showing the burning bush wouldn't be a good idea is God has his, if God exists and the, you know, capital G God, then he essentially would do whatever he wants. And if you don't agree with him, well, that sucks. <laughs> and that would, to me, not be a very fun idea because I want it, morality and all the rules would be set by him. And that doesn't necessarily make him correct in like a broad scope. I mean, you could have an evil God by this definition right, and right. you would still be stuck in the same train. Just the God's evil. See, I got two young kids, uh, uh, four and seven. And of course I want them to follow the rules and obey them, but I also wouldn't you know, strike them dead if they, <laughs> disobeyed most of those rules are there to keep them safe yeah, anyway I, because i, I got them. 11 month old believe me there's there's moments where i'm like you know what but i'm not gonna do anything <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> right at least you're honest or I like but him. but I, I agree that there there are some depictions of god that just make him to be outright scary or monstrous or unfair yeah. and, well, especially what's, with what's, all the evil in the world you know there's a yeah what's the story of, of uh him sending a bear to kill kids Mall, yeah the, um elisha naked dude um, or whatever uh, was it Elijah or Elisha? Elijah. Probably yeah. Elijah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that made fun of him for being bald or something. And Yeah. And I'm sure there's some big story to take out of that. <laughs> that's profet profound to people. But right. to me, it kind of just looks like don't laugh at bald people. And that seems like a very <laughs> odd rule. No, they, they were making fun. Of, they were telling him to go up you know, or, or go on up bald head. And, you know, so they were kind of making fun of that. They knew. So he, they were he mocking was, him and through mocking him, they were actually mocking God. Yeah. I personally believe that because these were youth that were doing this, I do believe that uh, satanic spirit was present in that action and yeah, has and something with to the do with it. Story. And, and, and uh, so um, there's an interesting scene in the movie about Jesus Christ played by um uh, uh, Jim Caviezel, if you've seen that, it was the movie. Last directed, Temptation? Yeah. Uh, no, directed, not Last Temptation. No, the Mel Gibson the, one. The, uh, yeah, the Mel Gibson Passion film. of the Christ. Yes. Passion, there's, thank you. There's a scene, I think it's Peter, and he's sitting down uh, after uh, just having run away, I think it was, uh, denying that he knew Jesus, and these uh, kids come up to him, and they're, they're, they're harassing him. And uh, the way they depicted the kids as having these demonic-looking faces and expressions. I remember the scene, yes. Yeah. So I believe that's precisely, that's just my opinion. Now, you know, other Christians may have their opinion. That's precisely exactly what I think happened at yeah. when, when 
the uh, when these youth were mocking uh, Elijah, they were actually mocking God and everything God is doing in the world by mocking Elijah. It's like sticking your middle finger up at God directly, but only doing it through the to the prophet. And I believe that demonic forces were involved 100% in that uh, in that at, at, during that moment. Yeah, this well, I think it's just been a funny looking ball, dude. If I can have a chance real quick, there's a much more simplistic historical context as well. These these youth, quote unquote, they, they were the same exact mob that Jezebel had sent to try to actually literally murder um, Ishmael's mentor. And, uh, Israel, uh, was his, uh, not Isaiah. Ishmael. And <laughs> oh, Ishmael had been translated to have this just chariot of fire to come down. Elijah. Elijah, thank you. And, and rescued him, literally took him, you know, saved him from this mob that he was running around the whole country trying to escape Jezebel's uh, uh, murderers, these, these mercenaries. And so he had, that's how he got saved. And as he's flying up on this, this chariot, you know, this, this miracle, he literally just uh, took, took his, uh, his, what they call his mantle and just threw it down on the ground to Ishmael. Ishmael took, took his mantle, took, took his, his, uh, his prophethood, so to say. His, yeah, his, it, that's the, is he the one, like the only other person not to die in the Bible? No, it's just two, actually three. But, um, so that's that's where when these kids were, or whatever that they were kids or not, is, is is also a question mark. When they finally found Ishmael, and they had, they had heard that how how who was it again? His mentor, Elijah and Elisha. Elijah, Elisha was the sort of disciple of Elijah. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'll keep, I, I might mix these names. But anyways, that's why they were harassing him, is because they were trying to murder his mentor, and they couldn't find him. As people were telling them that he just literally got translated to heaven, so that's why they were mocking him. The uh, Ishmael for, or not Ishmael, Elijah, thank you. And so basically in the, the context, as far as the bears concerned, they were in the wild. They were chasing him down. And so bears naturally maul people in the wild. And so the, the actual context is that God, you know, sometimes he'll, he'll protect people and just take away his protection. He'll, he'll take away whatever it is that, that causes a, a wild animal's instinct to hurt somebody. You know, so it wasn't that God sent bears. It was just that God stopped, you know, protecting these, these people trying to murder his prophet, he took the protection away from them, and the, the bears just did the bears did what bears normally do. It wasn't it wasn't God's fault necessarily. It was just it was certainly those those guys the the mob's fault, the mercenaries' fault for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Certainly, I, I'm in no position story. to argue Elijah and the bears at this moment. That's well, just the first thing that came to my mind. But I, again, I mean, <laughs> to, to me, it seems like there's a lot of you know, is this story read the way it is? Or mm -hmm. Neff wants to add things that aren't in the context, and you want to try to bring things that I would need to verify. And then, well, well these are these are in the bears of this particular part of the world are not grizzly bears. Grizzly bears sure will maul someone if they need to, but like bears a black bear won't. won't. Mm, so. No. A, a black bear will kill you if he wants to, and he's, the black bears have killed many people. Yeah, um, not really. But, and, <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, really. I mean, in their uh, yeah. black bear. Uh, uh, I'm not even sure that they anything. killed them in there. Go ahead. Uh, but, but I mean, I, I what I what I see is this: I see um, a, a complete disregard for the holiness of God. In, in, in our, <laughs> yeah, I, these things. I'm an atheist. Uh, well, right, and so uh, what I I'd also point out that. Um, if you if you read them through the Bible, one of the things that you might notice is that, uh, is that these kinds of events pop every every once in a while, where uh, something God does something that that's profoundly, uh, you know, very strong, very harsh, and and uh, and and people you know might have a problem with that, but but the context you mentioned. The context uh, you're adding, you say Neff might be adding things to the Bible. I don't think really so. I think if you read the Bible, you get the context in a long, drawn-out sense of who God is, what his character is like, what, how different we are from him, and everything, so that it's not difficult to read into a, a passage about this kind of a thing and see that these boys who were coming up to Elijah and mocking, oh yeah, go up, oh Baldy, and they were mocking him, that there was in fact the significance about the ball demonic the forces behind that. It wasn't just as simple as a group of kids coming up to mock a guy because he was bald. Uh, 
that that's not it if you read the bible you get a broader sense of the total battlefield of the supernatural whereby the the the, the forces of darkness are always striving to undo or undermine what God is doing in the world through his his disciples and so when you come across something like this you know a, a simple reading of it you'll miss all that but if you take the Bible into account as a whole uh, the books of the Bible you'll see well there's got to be much more going on than <clears throat> and, and it's clear that we're talking about a battle between light and dark right here and so and, but it also um, doesn't say they necessarily killed him. It just said he's mauled him. So, you know. Yeah. Just, well, I, I guess to, to, to this point and kind of where well, I, 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 I got to go to bed soon. So I got to get off here. But um, I was just looking up the Elisha and the bear story. And I found Answers in Genesis explanation of it. And Answers in Genesis has a third approach to why it's not a big deal. Nephilim has his description. Joel has his version. And um, Answers in Genesis makes the argument that by little children ever, they actually mean immature jerk-offs, essentially. And that's three different readings of the same story that all kind of share a message. Like yeah. I, can, I can see an overarching message between the three of them. But there are, again, three distinct readings. So, and I'm sure you all very much believe that you are correct, and this is part of the issue. Well, the, the bigger picture well, is that there's enough evidence in the Bible of God's good character, that he is That's loving and caring, I, exactly. that you can extrapolate those gaps. But it's not even necessary for us to interpret it. We're just speculating to say that there's right. possibilities. Yeah. Well, that that I really don't know the baby out with the By asking God, and, and you know that because he is, uh, he's given already so much demonstration of his, of his character that's positive, his justice yeah. and mercy and love. Well, that there, there, there's very likely a good explanation that we have thought of or haven't thought of that he's glad to tell us someday. Sure. Exactly. And one of the good things point. that makes that so clear is uh, one of the things that makes that so clear is that people uh, tend to forget all the, the 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 things that God says in in the Old Testament, even uh, that demonstrate the goodness of His character. You know, they 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 are looking for things to uh, you know to uh, to slight God for. But if, if you if you but they they're forgetting the passages where God says you know to the Hebrews, look, be good to the strangers who travel amongst you and treat them like your own, because I was good to you while you're in in bondage in Egypt. You know, treat your neighbor as your brother. You know, give to them who ask of you, because I give to those who ask of me, right? If you ask me for stuff and I'm giving, I'm good to give you things, well, how are you going to treat the guy that comes to your door in the middle of the night and asks you for food? You're going to not, you're going to say, go away, you old bum. Or are you going to say, I'll put a plate out for you, right? And this is the kind of things that God expresses about his character in the Old Testament. The God that Richard Dawkins calls uh, every word there is, right? right. So people tend to dismiss all mm -hmm. that, uh, people who are looking for something to slight God for, and forget all that. So here's the thing I want to point out. There's a big contract, a, a, a contrast, isn't there, between these statements that God makes to demonstrate his charity, his compassion, his love, his forgiveness, his long suffering, etc., in the Old Testament, and the way that he's depicted by atheists, on the other hand. There's something wrong here because both are in the Bible, allegedly, and we know the statements where God describes his good character in the Bible. That's a fact I can point them out. But then there's the way that atheists depict harsh circumstances that happen in the in the Old Testament, and they'll 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 slight God for that. So here's why my point is. Such a contradiction couldn't be true of God. God can't be both of these. God can't be an evil, vindictive, uh, 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 monstrous uh, hate monger that the atheists point him out to be and be saying these other things about his character on the other hand. So what this contrast demonstrates, I think, is the outrageous mis mis uh, um, uh, um, inact incorrect uh, description of God as character uh, made by atheists. Uh, that yeah. that incredible contradiction, contrast. Yeah, because yeah, um, regardless of all of these interpretations, the, the irrefutable contextual fact of that entire storyline is that God was protecting his people from genocidal, homicidal maniac atheists trying to murder the Jews. Irrefutable. Um, just, you know, these people were literally going around. They were murdering the Jewish people. They were trying to murder these prophets, and God stopped them. 
Well, the so, other example that's used a lot is with the Amalekites, how God ordered the destruction. You know, he had the, he could have destroyed them himself, but he asked the Israelites to right. go kill yeah. the and men, I, and women, and children, and even the animals. And and we look at that from a bystander perspective, and we're like, that's just awful. Like, how could a loving God do that? Even one flaw in his character kind of, you know, destroys his whole um, character. It's got to be. Um, a, a perfect god or or the the most frightening thing in the world would be a god that's all powerful but wasn't good <laughs> yeah um and so as an outsider when we don't know the history the context the reasoning and sometimes god gives reasons sometimes he doesn't but the you know the classic example is like if you're walking by and you look into a room and you see this man sawing off a child's leg and you're like that monster i got to do something to stop it who you know what kind of child abuse is this and um, but if you knew in context that that was a surgeon and that child's leg was gangrenous and they had to keep the infection from spreading, he was saving that child's life. It was a last ditch effort. And by cutting off the Amalekites, who knows, maybe they would have taken over. The Israelites would have been wiped out. We wouldn't have any record of, uh, I mean, God would probably have to start all over. But uh, that that wickedness, they had already turned their hearts. I mean, these were, these people, the enemies of the Jews were they would torture their children over fire. Like they would build statues and build a fire and get that metal statue really hot and then put newborn babies in the arms of this metal statue and they would sizzle and burn to death, uh, you know, pass over the fire. And that's yeah. the kind of stuff that God couldn't tolerate and had to put right. into to uh, civilizations that practice that kind of stuff. Exactly. And the Hebrews and these I, I people gotta go are to constantly... Enough. Can I get my last couple yeah, sure. of okay. please? Thanks. Yeah. I got to head out. So, um, I'm not trying to make the argument that the, I believe, more monster is usually what they say. Right? right. I'm not, as again, I'm not a hard atheist. I'm not an anti theist. Um, I do take a different broach to it than you guys do. You guys think I'm crazy and all the other stuff for the way I look at it, but I do. I do find there to be flaws in okay. the readings. I do find there to be um, reasons why I do not believe the Bible. Uh, you know, the descriptions that you're giving, Dr. Carter, are kind of comic book villainy to me. And, you know, the, the winner writes the books. So, of course, the Israelites are going to write all the, the people that they slaughter as evil and reprehensible and worthy of that. Um, that being said, um, I'm in no position. Secular history verifies. You know, based on the same I, reference, though. I'm in no history history verifies history. the character of the Canaanite tribes. It's random. It's not just because the Hebrews wrote about it in the Bible. Archaeology and historical records outside the Bible verify the types of cultures that would these people had were one in which they they had uh, uh, all kind of poly po uh, po polygamous and. Uh, 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 I, I don't even want to describe the kinds of things they were, okay? <laughs> the, you think of the worst kinds of things you can be lo locked up for today? This was considered normal in their societies, okay? And and we have verified that outside the Bible. So you can't just point the Bible and say, the Hebrews say so, therefore. Uh, no, it's been verified outside the Bible. It's also interesting that they're one of the few civilizations that records all of their dumb deeds and the bad things they've done. Like, you know, the Egyptians, oh, well, let's right. chisel off the face of this guy. He was terrible. Let, let's not let uh, future people know about uh, this blunder. And yet you read about all of the, the good and bad of, of Israel. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, this is a great conversation point, again for someone who probably has more knowledge in it. I mean, I'm just kind of rolling off the top of my head here. I didn't come prepared to discuss the morality of God oh, necessarily. That is a great but, point. If you're writing a, a book about your own people and your history, you don't write about what kind of sloths and monsters you were and how you uh, did evil things. And yeah, for 400 years, we followed this crazy God. We burned children in life. You know, I mean, you, you don't do that. You write, a, exactly. you write something that tells good about you. You make like the Egyptians love to do, like Dr. Carter pointed out. You make yourself, you puff your yourselves up and you make you you forget all the bad you don't write about the bad stuff yeah. you make yourselves look good the hebrews didn't do that as dr corner car so eloquently pointed out uh they they told it like it was i mean they just was straight off the cuff this is all the horrible mistakes that we've made as a people all these centuries you know we've been doing this and god would would come to us and say you know you've been naughty and i'm gonna correct you and he'd get tough about it and then three or you know hunt 200 years later they're right back doing it again you know yeah. and they were just trying to write to make up a religion first of all what would the motive be but why include 
in very detailed language, you know, the, the genealogies and so-and-so begat so-and-so. I mean, that doesn't make for a very, you know, interesting sci-fi book. It's, it's, there's just so full of history that even the, the secular um, historians will take a Bible with them when they're doing archaeological digs because they know that it's so accurate. That even yeah, if they don't believe the God that's in it, they know that at least the history is so the best thing that they've got for figuring out where these uh, ancient uh, civilizations might be located yeah. and what happened. Yeah, the, the argument that the Bible was boring, therefore it's accurate, is an interesting take. Well, it's not boring. I'm not yeah, really boring. Just, I'm saying when he points out things like embarrassment, those are things that you can are likely to um, prove that that he historians use to prove that you know there's validity in what's what they're writing down. Exactly, um, as Dr. Carter pointed out, the Hittite culture was discovered because archaeologists used the Bible as a roadmap where to find them. Uh, the Bible says that the tribe of so-and-so existed from this city to the east, to that one to the west, and that one to the south, and that one to the north. They, it draws maps. Oh, if we go dig there, that's where we find these guys, right? According to the Bible. Let's see if that's true. Boom. Found the Hittite. Atheist scholars said for 70 or 80 years prior to that, the Hittites were imaginary. Those people never existed. And then the archaeologists, using the Bible as a roadmap, found them. And now you can buy Hittite pottery at Sotheby's. Yeah, before, before you had to go, man, I just wanted to let you know as well, there's, there's plenty of other topics, of course, about evidence of God and science uh, outside of the Bible. You mentioned physics was one of your fortes earlier. I mean, I've, I've been a physicist as well. So if we ever get to meet one of these channels again, I'd love to go over those those aspects, the things that you, that you said you feel more familiar with as well. Yeah, or as I exactly enjoy you coming in, because as an anti-theist, you're actually a, a, a likable kind of a guy. Yeah, he you're, is, not a, you're not a salivating, you know, slander, throwing uh, uh, hateful kind of a person. You're actually just a regular guy. And so I appreciate that. And well, I appreciate you. Yeah, no, uh, I'm, I'm not, not trying to put you on the spot at all either. Too. Yeah, I'm myself just, up better in the future, so. But uh, yeah, yeah. Don't feel like you're pinned down either. I I'm just curious because I I don't get to, you know, hear um, different arguments made as often. You know, I, you you tend to be surrounded by like-minded people for the lions, reason. The lions so it's, it's nice to hear different perspectives and understand where you're coming from. I, I I'm still really curious what um about your um, atheism or anti-theism or, or your I'm I'm uh, you know I I do frequent for another day. Room. And uh, stand, uh, what's it? Standing for truth and Smokey saying, you know, I, I frequent those for all, I've the, seen you, all, yeah, all I've these seen conversations. You yeah. So yeah, uh, but yeah, I'm sure we'll meet each other again. Pleasure talking to y'all. Nice to meet good. you, Doctor Carter. Have a and, good, uh, yeah. good night. Good night, or good on you. Have a good one. Yeah. Uh, I created I'm not sure a if you guys have... Oh, sorry.